as always, if you have not been on webinars before, you can um, leave your uh, comments or questions in the chat uh, and I will happily answer them when I can during the, during the presentation. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, I'm really excited to host this one. I hope that you all enjoy it. It's obviously about thinking outside of the box. Uh, so I hosted a webinar two nights ago and that was about, what was it about? Reconnecting with nature, sorry. I had a bit of a brain fade there. Reconnecting with nature um, and it went really, really well. And part of what I talk about today is to go hand in hand with that. So um, if you did miss that one and you didn't get to watch it, it is on YouTube or will be on our YouTube channel shortly. Um, that's Reconnecting with Nature. Um, today, I wanted to present and speak about thinking outside of the box. Um, so how um, my photographic journey started and how to progress as a photographer. Now, the beautiful thing about photography is that there is no set way to, or there's no set rules when it comes to photography. Um, and that allows us the opportunity to manipulate our camera and angles and positions and all of that to get um, different or specific type of shots that we have in mind. Um, so like I said, no right or wrong way to do it. Um, obviously, I'll share a lot of my thoughts and the way that I do things and things that I look for when I'm out in the field. Um, it doesn't mean it's right or wrong, but what I, what I like to try and do from these webinars is obviously give you advice um, from my experience in terms of whatever the topic is that we're talking about. Um, and you can take and use whatever you want to use or don't want to use, um, and you can use it um, and integrate it into your own photography. So my photography started, sure, 12 years ago um, when I first started guiding. So I've been in the industry for 13 years, but grew up in, um, in the lodge environment. Uh, when I first became a guide, the first year, I mentioned the other night, the first year of my guiding career, I did not own a camera. Um, I wanted to focus solely on my guest experience and my guiding. Um, I wanted to make sure that um, I was obviously well qualified as a guide um, and also comfortable guiding guests before I reached out and started doing things like photography. My first camera was probably one of the cheapest ones on the market, a little point and shoot, um, <clears throat> which I kind of loved and hated because um, it's what really got me into photography, believe it or not, but um, any still shot was great. I could take a still picture because um, the shutter, once I pressed it, would take about three, four seconds before it actually took a picture. Um, and if there was action or an animal was moving towards me, <clears throat> there was no chance that I was getting that picture of that animal. And if I was, it was very, very blurred just because I had no understanding of photography. So what happened then is I started to enjoy photography more and more. I saved up a whole bunch of money, invested in my first DSLR um, and started playing around with that. But the problem with that was that it arrived and I took it out of the box and had absolutely no clue how to use it. Um, I didn't understand what ISO meant. I didn't understand aperture meant, what aperture meant. I didn't understand any of that. Um, and that's okay. I mean, that's where we all start. Uh, you got to start some way. So I did panic. I did freak out a little bit because I didn't, I'd now invested all this money and had no idea what I was going to do with this expensive piece of gear. Um, and the way that I started was um, I got straight onto YouTube. I watched a lot of tutorials. Um, I then got into the garden, started photographing birds, um, started photographing anything and everything, playing around with settings, playing around with my exposure, trying to understand how the settings all works together. Um, and if you are someone watching now and you are beginning that journey, <clears throat> it can be overwhelming because there is a lot going on. There's a lot to know about a camera, but you need to dissect it into different pieces. Learn one thing, make sure that you understand it before you're moving on to the next thing. Um, so this is a little bit of advice from my learning. I was fortunate to guide at Londo Lozi for just over four years. Um, which at the time and still to this day is very well equipped um, with photographic equipment. So they've got a creative hub there um, and they also have a number of great photographers there. 
Uh, and when I was there, there was probably about five of us that were taking photographs. And the nice thing was that it was a very good learning environment in terms of photography. Um, we would often get together after drives. Um, I would still sit in my garden and be crazy. People would think I was strange, just wandering around camp, taking random photos. Um, but we would often sit together because we did blogs and things all together. We would sit and, sit and we would share advice with each other about um, camera settings and how we got specific shots. Um, and that all obviously helps uh, to, to grow your own knowledge and to develop your own style. Um, it's very difficult to say that I have a specific style. If you ask me, Trevor, what is your style of photography? I can't tell you because I think with photography, not only the gear, but photography and you as an individual, you're constantly evolving, you're constantly um, getting better, you're learning different skills. Um, and so you can't have one specific style. Yes, your images may look similar, um, but the quality and the type of images that you, you are going to be taking is going to be, well, it will get better and better and better and better slowly. Um, <clears throat> so I thought I would share a little bit today uh, about thinking outside of the box. Uh, just to give you some ideas, I know my last point is about drawing inspiration. Um, so I just want to say that anything that I talk about today, um, it's not right or wrong. It's not the only way to do things. Um, you don't have to listen to what I have to say. I hope you do because I hope it will help you. Um, but it's just to try and get you to think in a different way when it comes to photography, especially if you have been on safari a number of times and you've gotten a number of similar images or the same images, um, just to try and get you thinking a little bit more and um, looking for different kinds of images that you can get while you are out in the field. Um, just give me two seconds here. I want to bring up this. Um, I hope you can all see that. So thinking outside of the box. Okay. What will we cover? So classic images, um, angles. So how angles affect photography, black and white images, creating a mood, um, looking for different images. That is a crucial one. Panning radial blur. I know that that is not for everybody. Um, but it is something worth playing around with because you, the results can be surprising at times. And then I'm just going to just chat a little bit about um, drawing inspiration and how I draw inspiration when it comes to my photography and when I'm out in the field. Um, so having said that, first image. Okay, there is absolutely nothing wrong with this image. It is a beautiful image. Okay, yes, I took it, I know. So I am um boasting a little bit but i absolutely love it it's a leopard in a tree it doesn't get much better than that composition wise i really enjoy it because of the tail um, on the right hand side i haven't cut off um, any body parts something to that's simple but always remember when uh, you are looking through your viewfinder don't only focus on the main part of your subject which in this case would be um, the face of the leopard but there's nothing wrong with this image um, all these images that I'm showing you now, there's absolutely nothing wrong with them. And um, there's nothing wrong with taking more of them. Um, but we will get into why I'm showing you these images shortly. Another one, this is from the crater. Um, it's not to say that there's nothing special about it. You know, this for me, this picture, um, and another reason why I started photography was for the memories. Um, the memories... Uh, I mean, I was talking the other night and I'd gone through images from eight years ago and it's crazy that's crazy the memories that an image can hold. I mean, you can look at a single still image and remember an entire sighting or an entire day. Um, this one, for example, this was taken last year um, in Ngorogoro Crater. I've got a number of photos from the crater. Um, but to me, this is just one of the classic scenes because you get these old buffalo bulls covered in mud. Um, <clears throat> you've got the, the egrets around them and then obviously a lot of springbuck and other antelope all over. If you haven't been to the crater, it's an incredible place. Um, it is full of wildlife. Uh, wherever you drive, you're constantly seeing wildlife. Um, you constantly, you, there's a, a, a rich array of uh, antelope species. 
Um, predator viewing there is good. Um, pho photography speaking, it's also great. It's something different. Um, you, you struggle to get the sky in your images, which isn't a problem. Um, you actually have that blue because you're sitting in the crater and you're sitting so low, you almost get that blue haze um, of the backdrop in your images. So classic image, um, once again, nothing wrong with it. Um, yeah, beautiful. Um, you know, I added the buffalo and the rhino in here because a lot of questions that I get asked when I'm on safari is how do you photograph large animals? Well, the large animals, things like elephants, rhino, um, buffalo, dark skinned animals. Um, you know, especially during drier months when the vegetation isn't vibrant and it isn't lush and it's not green. Um, it can be very difficult to make your subject stand out. Um, in this case, uh, I want to say it's a simple image. It's a beautiful image. I absolutely love the image. What makes this image is the light that comes from behind the rhino. Um, there's nothing specific that the rhino is doing. Um, so in terms of an image, and I, I want to stay away from the word saying it's a simple image because it's not a simple image. Um, there's no such thing as a simple image. Um, what I like about it is that it is a rhino. It's not doing anything. Okay, it's, it's showing movement with this front leg, but it's got that beautiful golden light coming from behind it. And this was early one morning. Um, so that really stands out to me. Um, and that obviously um, is a memory for me. Uh, another one, leopard on a termite mound. Doesn't get much better than that. When you're driving around and you're on safari, you think, ah, oh, leopard in a tree would be nice or leopard on a termite mound would be nice. It is, it is nice. It's great. And I'll, I'll, I will always, I'll never stop a guest from taking a photograph of a picture of a leopard in a tree or a leopard on a termite mound. Um, but like I said, you'll get, you'll get to see where I'm going with all of this. Next one, beautiful male line, beautiful. Some of the be most beautiful male lines I've ever seen um, are in Ndutu. This was taken in the marsh area and Ndutu is a part of um, Tanzania that borders the Serengeti. Um, this is from our trip, um, the best of Serengeti uh, during the, uh, the wet months. Uh, you can see the nice vibrant colors behind him. Um, simple composition here using rule of thirds. You can see where his head is positioned. It's top right. Um, but he is looking left. That's why there is more space on the left-hand side of the image. Um, so there's absolutely nothing wrong with taking photographs like the, the, the images that I've just shown you. They are all beautiful images. Um, here's another one. This is Photography, remember, has no rules. It's about storytelling. It's about the memory that it holds for you. Uh, this was actually also in the crater. We must have just missed this um baby being born um such a special moment because we came across uh, this little guy and mom when um it was sort of staggering and trying to find its feet and wobbling around um and once again that's it's a memory shot it's um for me photography is not about going out there taking a photograph that's going to be award-winning for me the pho photographs are for me for me only um, and obviously I like to share my work with everybody um, because I hope that I can inspire others in a way that um, the people that I follow inspire me. Um, so this is just a beautiful moment that is caught. This was also in the crater during the day um, driving around. Um, you can see by the harsh light how, um, how hot it was but yeah such a cute moment baby and mom both standing facing the same direction. I had to add this one in just because it's probably one of my favorite male leopards of all time. He is known as the Makatini male in Londolozi or the, what's he called in the south? I've forgotten now, um, but also absolutely beautiful light. Late afternoon, it was quite a strange afternoon in terms of light because it wasn't really a blue sky that we had, but we had a bit of gold coming from the sun. And it was weird because I took this photograph and once again, he walked up onto a termite mound and he was scanning the area for any potential food. And his pose is absolutely beautiful. But he's standing there posing for food and I thought, oh yes, leopard in the open, standing on a mound, 
the sun's behind me, it does not get better than this. Um, and I took this photograph and I looked at it and the colors were, from the back of my screen just looked incredible. Um, you know, it's, it's a dull background, but there's something about his coach here that really, really sticks out to me. Um, and I really, really like it. So there is a reason why I've shown you all these images. There's absolutely nothing wrong with taking pictures like that. Um, I'm very proud of these pictures that I've shown you now. Um, <clears throat> and why I showed you, let me, uh, let's, sorry, let's do this. I could have done this from the beginning. That's my fault. Why I showed you is because we're gonna get a little bit more into the technical stuff. Um, so how do you change, how do you change your way of thinking in photography? How do you become a better photographer? Um, you know, we talk about how do we take better photographs of larger animals that we struggle with? How do we portray the, a, a specific mood, whether it be how we feel about what we're looking at or the scene that we're looking at or the subject that we're looking at or how do we portray the mood of the subject that we're looking at? Um, and it can be a very difficult thing to do. And it isn't always possible. Um, so here I mentioned angles. Um, I personally love low angles. I'll never get out of a vehicle um, or get guests out of a vehicle in an area that it is not safe to do so. Um, this was taken actually from a camp. Um, so there was a fence around, but um, the mood that I wanted was to portray this old buffalo bull. So uh, you obviously get the herds of buffaloes that move all together. And then you get these old boys, which are called dugger boys. Um, and they are males that either get kicked out of these herds or simply cannot keep up with these herds. Um, and dugger mean is a Zulu word for mud because they love to spend their time around um, water sources, coat their body in mud. Um, it's also great for texture shots. We'll get into that. Um, but for me, these buffalo bulls, they've lived a very tough life. If you think of them, they've fought each other for females. And you think of herds in the, in the greater Kruger National Park area can get up to a thousand animals strong. And that's all different family units that have um, united together. And these guys have to fight each other and defend themselves, not only against other, other bulls, but against predators as well. And you think that these guys then get ushered or pushed out of the group or they leave the group by choice and they fall either they, they go off on their own or they form these small bachelor herds. And imagine how difficult a life it must be for that individual once he's out on his own, such as this guy. But you can see he is still in perfect condition. He is in beautiful condition. So I wanted to portray, for me, it's, it's, it's this, okay, if I have to be critical, this branch or the tree stump obviously um, doesn't fit the image, but it is there. That is nature. That is photography. You shoot what you see. Um, so I wanted to portray these guys in a very powerful manner. Um, and what changed it was I was actually sitting up on a deck looking at this guy and he came down to the water and the wind was blowing from me to him. And I was in camp. Um, the wind was blowing from me to him and he obviously picked up my scent and he was staring at me. And I thought, ah, oh, yes, he's picked up my scent. He can obviously smell me. Um, it would be a really cool picture with his head up looking at me. So then I thought, let me go get my camera. And as I walked down the stairs, the scene in front of me, looking at him, got better and better and better as I got lower, 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 um, to the point where he was pretty much above eye level. And I went and I got my picture, or my camera, and I took a photograph. And I was very, very happy with, with the result that I got, just because I feel like this image, just by changing an angle, simply changing an angle, portrayed how I felt about these old buffalo bulls. Um, let's go next, angles here. Okay, so there's many different ways to look at it. This hasn't happened to me very often. I think I've had two sightings of cheetah at sunset on a fallen over log. First one, I'd never memory card in my camera, but we're not gonna dwell on that. That's past news. Um, and I still have feelings about that because it was a similar scene. 
Um, <clears throat> but there's two ways to take a photograph here. So what I'm trying to do is to get you to think outside of the box. So angles is, a, is one way. It's a great way to, to get different perspective shots. Like I said, it's not always possible. Um, and <clears throat> I know that it's something as us guides um, or wild eye guides, you know, Mark, Johan, um, Andrew, everybody, when we're out in the field, this is the kind of stuff that we are looking for to try and help you um, to get different shots. So firstly, this was while I was a full-time guide at Londo's. I was doing a, a, a private photographic safari. Um, and this, this cheetah we found late afternoon, you can see the sun, how low it is. He was walking and uh, about three, 400 meters up ahead of him, we could see this fallen over tree that he was standing at. And um, I think it's also a key thing of why it is great to join us on these trips is because of our guiding background and being able to read animal behavior also um, benefits your photography in a huge way um so i could see that this guy was heading towards this log and i said um we were we were obviously driving on the other side so we had the sun behind us our vehicle cheetah golden light on him short grass and he was walking through beautiful so i said to my guest listen there's a fallen over tree the chances are very good that he's going to climb up onto that tree instead of sitting here next to him and taking multiple photos of exactly the same thing as he walks through this grass, let's go ahead, high risk, high reward, go ahead, let's position firstly with the sun behind us. If he jumps onto the log, we are going to have a cheetah standing in beautiful golden light. Um, so we went and we parked and we sat and the cheetah stopped and he sniffed around and got to about 50 meters away and he actually picked up pace. Um, and he came and he literally ran up this tree and he posed like this. So we were sitting on the other side. We got photos of him looking like this, looking in all different directions. I looked behind me, I saw the sun dipping and I said to my guest, right, we're going to go the other side. And he said to me, no, 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 this is perfect. This is perfect. Stay here. And I said to him, we've got some incredible images of this cheetah sitting on this or standing on this log with golden light. The only thing that's going to happen is that we're going to take 100, 200, 300 more photos of him doing exactly the same thing. Let's high risk, high reward, change our angle and see what we can get. I took the vehicle, drove all the way around, and this is what we saw. And to me, as beautiful as it was with the light coming onto him, for me having the sun behind him and still being able to pick up the detail of the cheetah, um, is this this is the money shot out of that whole sighting that we had in that golden light shooting back into the sun like this um, was my highlight i do have another image um, of this it's not in this presentation unfortunately but um, i do have an image of him looking at us as well um, which is also absolutely stunning um, so it's just different ways to look at a sighting to get different pictures um, because for me, there's no point in firing off 100 pictures of exactly the same thing when you can take 20 pictures and then start to try and get your brain to, to work. Photography, the only way you're going to get better is by testing yourself, by pushing through your comfort zones. Um, and, you know, I always say on the trips that I host, if you've got an idea, let me know. Tell me, you know, I see, I get into a sighting and I see a specific photograph. And that's what I'll tell you about. But potentially you have a different photograph in mind. So tell me, because it can also be much better than my idea, because in our brains, we're all thinking about pictures in a different way. And that's what I'm trying to get to do here is to try and get you to subconsciously take this information that I'm giving you away from here and process it in your own way. And when you're out in the field, the more you think about it and the more you do it, um, the more subconsciously you're going to start making these adjustments. Another one, low angles, changes everything, changes the whole feel. Um, black and white, yeah, I'll talk about black and white shortly, but low angle, very tight, very zoomed in, um, eyes are wide open, but just the angle gives the, the, the image so much more strength and so much more power than if I was a meter higher. This was a young female leopard. She was lying on a riverbed at eye level with me. 
Um, so it allowed me the opportunity to take photos of her at eye level. It's not that I got out the car um, and lay on my stomach or anything like that. Um, and that's why where um, what I mentioned earlier comes into is that it's not always possible to, if you have a shot in mind of the angle and being lower or anything like that, that you can get that shot. Um, it's, sorry. That's one more. Um, insane shot, thank you. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so it's, it's not always possible to get that shot, but at least you are thinking about it. And that's, that's what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to get you to think about what potentially, what, what other photographs you could potentially get. And it's not to say that a leopard in a tree isn't a great photograph. It is a stunning photograph. But how do you, how do you grow as a photographer when you have 10 different sightings of a leopard in a tree and they're all from the same angle? The, um, and what I'm saying now is that there's nothing wrong with it. So there's an, absolutely nothing wrong with having 10 pictures of 10 different leopards in 10 different trees because each scene is different, the light is different, um, there's a whole bunch of variables that are different. But once you're happy that you have got that picture of a leopard in a tree, where do you go from there? How do you, how do you stay stimulated? How do you keep your passion for wildlife um, going and for photography going? You, there's so many people that just think, okay, well, I've, you know, I've got that picture ready, so um, it's a waste of time. It's not a waste of time. Take another picture of that leopard in the tree, but look at how you can take a different image of that leopard in the tree. And there's an example that'll come up. Here again, male lions. We all know lions. You've been on safari, you know what lions do. 80% of the time of their life is they sleep. So I always believe that there is a photographic opportunity in every sighting. Um, it's not to say, I spoke about it the other night, um, where you've got to find a balance between photography and your passion. Um, so you've got to find a balance between when do I pick my camera up and take a photograph and when do I leave it on the seat next to me and just enjoy the moment. Because if you're constantly looking through your viewfinder and you're constantly taking images, um, then you're going to firstly disconnect um, automatically every time you pick up your camera to your face and you look through the viewfinder, there's a disconnect, a disconnection happening between you and your subject. Um, so it's a very fine line because if you get into the mindset where it's only about photographs, 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 you'll find that your wildlife passion starts to drop and it just becomes a need to get a better photograph, a better photograph, a better photograph, as opposed to photographing what you're looking at um, and what you're passionate about. And you can see when you go onto social media, you can see images where, sorry, I'm just being attacked by a moth. Um, you can see in those images where um, a, a guide, a guest, a person has taken a photograph for the sake of taking a photograph. And you can see an image where someone has taken a photograph um, using their passion. Um, so as I mentioned, lions sleeping passed out. We must have sat about two and a half hours for this guy to wake up. Um, he, there was a, it was in the Manileti riverbed and there was a, almost a bank that then dropped off to another bank and he was lying on the bottom bank. So we had first stopped and we had parked at the top and we were watching him. It was the afternoon, he was passed out sleeping um, I was also hosting a photographic safari at the time as well. I was a full-time guide. Um, and <clears throat> we were chatting about this specific coalition. Um, I'm not going to get uh, distracted and go off, but he was part of a coalition called the Majingalan Coalition. Very powerful, very dominant in the Sabi Sands during my time there. Um, and we were sitting there and I was chatting to all the photographers and um, telling them about the story behind these guys and when they came into the area. And um, we had spent a lot of time there and the guests eventually said, you know, there's no photograph here. Um, and I said to them, there is, well, I said to them, there is, we've just got to be patient. 
And I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to reposition our vehicle because firstly, I mentioned angles, angles changes everything. Um, and secondly, there is a photograph. He is going to give us an opportunity. Um, yes, they do sleep a lot, but you know, it was afternoon. Um, it was starting to cool down. They tend to get more active in the evenings, being more nocturnal. There's a chance that he was going to sit up, lick, groom, yawn, roar, anything like that. Um, but I said to them, you know, if we can get down to eye level with him and he just opens his eyes, even just for five seconds, and we take one photograph, we've won. Because all you need is one photograph. You don't need 100 photographs of him lying like this with his eyes open at eye level. All you need is one and you've won. And it takes that whole two and a half hours of us sitting there chatting about line dynamics and chatting about photography. Um, it makes it all worthwhile when a plan comes together and you get that one shot that you're after. Black and white images, creating a mood. So I love black and white images personally. They depict a certain mood. Um, not all images can be uh, converted into black and white. I did a blog post on it a little while ago. Um, and why I wanted to bring black and white into this uh, webinar was to explain my method or my thinking behind um, black and white images. Um, so, like I said, they often have a way of um, creating a lot of mood to an image, um, especially when you're thinking of a powerful beast like a male lion. If you look at this mood created here and his eyes, I mean, his whole face just pops. He was one of the Matimba males. He had completely dark mane, um, light face. So black and white, it, it, it just pops. So there's a few things that I look out for. Um, and it's another thing that you can look out for when you are in the field. And that um, is another step in growth in photography. When you can go out into the field and you can sit there and you can say that is going to make a great black and white photograph or that is going to make a great sepia photograph. If you can get to that point, you obviously are learning and you're shooting for a picture that you will obviously develop in black and white later on. But you're in the mindset of understanding black and white conversions and what works well and what doesn't work well in black and white. So for me personally, when I'm out in the field, um, what I look for is heavy contrast. So very light areas, very dark areas. It can either be a very light face, very dark mane, very dark face, very light mane. It can happen either way. Um, another thing is clean backgrounds or clean surroundings. Um, that's where you start to get into high key photography, where you can blow out the background, create a black and white image and have just your subject there. There's actually, I think there is a nice Franklin shot that is in here um, that will come up. So with that in mind, black and white creates certain moods. It also brings out certain textures. So when I talk about there's a photograph in, 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 in every opportunity or in every sighting, there really is. So here, this was a, a male line taken in, in the Kruger National Park, um, which was actually, there were two brothers, they had a buffalo kill um, and it was quite hot. Uh, they were lying in the shade, there was patches of sunlight. So actually around his mouth and his tongue now is where the sunlight was. Um, and so there wasn't a great photograph. He was lying in long grass. He was full belly. He was panting. His eyes were closed. There wasn't really a shot on offer. And this is where thinking out the box comes into it is what can I potentially get? What is the position of his paws? Is his paws in the open? Can I get a shot of the pad of his paw, um, of the underneath of his paw, the pad? Um, to show the size or to show how it looks. Um, then this guy sat up and he was kind of, you know, half breathing and moving and this, you know, he just, he looked uncomfortable. Um, he had just come from feeding off the carcass. So his, his stomach was um, extremely large. Um, he had a bit of blood in that around his face and his paws and he started licking and grooming. 
Now, a wide angle shot of this wouldn't give you the same feel as a close up. So I went in and my aperture was actually fairly large, probably around F4. So you'll see that the main in that is all blurred. That's not where I want the attention. I want the attention on the tongue. Look at that tongue. That is what I was after. I was after getting the fine details um, of the tongue. In color, it doesn't look nice at all. Um, just it, it, the light was too harsh and the, to expose for the scene was very, very difficult. But sitting there, I thought if I can get a decent close up with this guy's tongue out, um, I'm going to be able to show off these spines and everything on the tongue and how rough it is. Okay, here's three and one. Um, so this also just gives you a different idea of how to Z, how to photograph in black and white. Sorry, I'm getting excited and ahead of myself. Um, so zebras already they black and white animals. So naturally, um, a black and white image is going to make them look good. Um, it's about shooting at different angles and using either color or black and white to your advantage. Um, their coats are a great example. Take a photograph of their coat in black and white. You pick up a lot of detail. Um, and it's once again, it's thinking about, I've taken a picture of a zebra. How many more pictures of a zebra do I want standing or do I want drinking at a water hole? Um, you've got to think of how can I push myself? How can I get a different shot of these zebras drinking water? So for me here, yeah, these, there was a couple of, well, there was a herd of zebra and they were all drinking. And if you look at the picture on the left, you'll see that behind is another blurred zebra, um, also with his head down. So I went in really tight here, um, as opposed to taking another photograph of another zebra drinking water. I tried to do something different, um, something that pops out and I, and I focused on the closest zebra's mane um, to pick up the detail with the black and white in mind, um, it pretty much looked black and white on the back of my screen as it was because it was filled with black and white stripes of the zebra and blurred out the um, background uh, of the other zebra. So it is a little bit more of an arty image. Um, it doesn't, uh, not everybody enjoys this kind of photography. I really, really do because it's something different and because it tests me. And you know what the beauty of these days or the modern days, is with mirrorless cameras and the DSLRs is that you can take as many photographs as you like. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Um, let me just... You can take as many photographs as you like and the ones that you don't like, you can delete. Easy as that. But one thing that I do suggest, it sounds stupid, but before you delete those images, understand why you're deleting them. So in this case, Maybe you don't like the image of the zebra and the mane with the zebra's coat behind, but why don't you like it? Would you rather have had the whole image of them drinking? Uh, would you rather have had it in a landscape orientation? Understand why you want to, um, why you're deleting that, that image. And the reason why I say this is because the more you travel and the more times you go on safari, the more opportunities you are going to get. And you're not going to necessarily have the exact same opportunity, but you might get something similar. And by understanding why you've deleted and rejected certain images will help you in the future uh, to, to take better photographs. <clears throat> Middle one, leopard in a tree. I said nothing wrong with it. Absolutely nothing wrong with it. Um, the color of this one, um, this was actually the same sighting of the very first picture I showed you on the slideshow. Um, just in a portrait orientation, uh, we repositioned and um, it was quite difficult at this stage. You can actually see if you look at the top right hand side of the image, um, it, it, it was very, very light. The exposure was difficult. It was late morning. Um, so the sun was very harsh. And remember what I said about um, contrast, black and white loves contrast. Um, so it's not necessarily that this is a unique and a different shot, but sitting in the vehicle at the time, early morning, beautiful colors in the sky, beautiful lights on the leopard. There's no need to look at black and white images. As the, as the day started to get warmer um, and the light started to get a lot harsher, we started to get contrast of the leopard, the subject and the tree um, being in the shade. And we started to get this bright sky behind. Automatically, my mind switches to, that's gonna be a nice black and white. 
um, because of the contrast. And the same goes for this buffalo on the right hand side. We all talk about how difficult it is to photograph large animals. Often it just takes angles and looking at things in a different way. Take photographs just of its mouth or just of its mouth drinking water or just of its eye, close up of its eye. You don't always have to shoot wide. Wide is nice sometimes with large herds to show off and showcase the area in which the animal is moving. Um, because often if you're only shooting tight images, um, it's not necessarily showing off the area that you were in, um, which isn't always important to everybody, but I sometimes do like to shoot a bit wider. I've been very guilty, especially when I was a full-time guide of being very tight with my images. Um, but it is nice to take wider shots to show off animals in their environment. Um, but in this case here, once again, heavy contrast. Um, so there was a lot of light on, on the, the um, buffalo's face and a lot of dark shadow areas around it. Um, so simple close-up tight shot portrait, um, obviously focused on the eye. Um, with the mindset to post-process it into a black and white. And you can see how that buffalo pops out. So those two buffalo shots that I've shown you are very, very different. The one was a simple angle change that made the photograph. Um, and in this case, it's a tight up, close up shot of a buffalo's face converted into a black and white that makes the shot. So there's two different ways that you can already look at photographing buffaloes. Elephant. So this is just playing around, it's messing around. That's, that's what photography is about. And that's what's fun about photography is we have the ability to mess around, to play around. And you know, this specific day, I remember sitting there and um, there was a group of male elephants around us. I was hosting a private safari and um, they were so close. It was so difficult to photograph them because um, we couldn't shoot wide enough to get the full animal in. So we had to think outside the box. We had to think about um, texture shots we had to think about because if you look at this trunk it's absolutely beautiful look at the detail look at the detail on on the tusks um, you'll see that small groove um, on the tusk that's closest to us that small groove that actually comes from the elephant when they pick up vegetation you'll often see them hitting the branch against their trunk and over years and years and years um, they start to develop that groove on it but um, this was an occasion where thinking outside the box you go um, uh, as high or high aperture as possible because you think a large animal close to you, if you're shooting at 2.8, your depth of field is very narrow. In that case, for example, only the tusk would be in focus. So shooting larger animals closer to the vehicle um, and wanting to display the detail, we need a high aperture. So shooting at, you're, you're looking at F14 and upwards if, if, if you can. Um, because it's such a large and round shape, you want to try and have as much um, in focus as possible. And this, this for me, okay, it's not everyone's cup of tea. I, it's one of my favorite shots. It's one of my favorite black and white pictures, um, just because of how different it is. Um, it's, it's, it, it is, it's a completely random photo, but for me, I feel it somehow really works nicely. Um, this as well, completely random. Composition, composition, angles, and black and whites, changing the, 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 the image completely. Um, yes, I could have gone and gotten the whole, um, the whole leopard's head in, um, but where the leopard was sitting was in sunlight, but behind it was complete shadow. So it was in a riverbed and there was a whole bunch of branches and things that were um, hanging over on the edge of the riverbed and inside was just this dark coloration. Um, and we had followed, the, we were driving in the riverbed, the leopard was walking next to us. Um, a monkey saw the leopard and started alarming. So the leopard actually sat down and was just looking up at the monkey. Um, and yes, I could have done the whole head um, with the dark background, but in that case, I started to pick, a bit, pick up a bit of the, the lighter coloration um, outside of the shadows. Um, so I went for something completely different uh, with the shot. I went outside of the rule of thirds. Um, I made 10% of my image the subject and the rest is completely back, but it works. Um, and why does it work? Because of, look at all the space that I've left for, for the leopard to look into. You've got the glint in the leopard's eye. 
it's a unique shot. It's not a shot. And this isn't me um, boasting about my images. It's, it's not the case at all. It's, it's me showing you images that you can also get that are different to anybody else's images. And I'm not saying that your images aren't different. If each of our images um, that do, whether it's you listening or watching this, uh, this webinar or me sitting here, each of our, our images are different and they're unique in their own way. And that's what's so great about it. But I'm just trying to, like I mentioned earlier, get you to explore in your mind different opportunities. This is the high key one I was talking about. So this was self-drive driving through Kruger National Park uh, one morning. And the, the light actually wasn't even bad at all. Um, and we were driving and this uh, Swainson uh, spur file was sitting on this branch. And as I drove past, he was calling, calling, calling in the morning and I stopped. I looked at him and I also suddenly thought, you know, he, he had this beautiful coloration on him. Um, but you can see all the detail. Look at all the shadows um, and the contrast in the feathers and on the body. Um, and that's what's, even though they're, they're in, in, in color, they're beautiful birds. They've got this red coloration on their face, um, brown bodies. Um, and it's also a great color photo photograph. But when I sat there and I looked at him, I instantly noticed all the contrasting areas, the dark areas. And um, I thought to myself, that's going to make a great high key image. And this is a good example of um, having a clean background because you can blow out the background. Um, the, whatever's in the background, in this case, it's just sky. You can blow it out. It doesn't matter. What matters is exposing for your subject. And instantly in my mind, blowing out the background, I then start to think of a black and white. So um, also works very well with vultures on dead trees, the leadwood trees that you get um, in Southern Africa. Um, so eagles, vultures. Um, vultures, actually, I mentioned them because um, a black and white image of a vulture sitting in a dead tree with no leaves uh, depicts a very, a, a very mystical dramatic feel um, and showcases what a vulture is. I mean, yes, they are scavenger birds, but that's exactly what a black and white image, um, especially a high key image like this, portrays of the bird. Looking for different images, okay? So this is now messing around. Um, this was taken, I mentioned earlier that I learned a lot of my photography from sitting in my garden, and this was actually taken in my garden. Um, it's completely random. It's the coat of an Inyala. Um, but something that I think we often overlook is uh, we've always got to get the headshots of an animal or we've got to get the, the perfect ears of an animal facing towards us. or we've got to get the motion of the foot moving or um, we've got to get the whole animal. That's not necessarily the case um, at all. Um, I like to take pictures like this because they are unique, they're very different images. Um, this here is a beautiful um, photograph of the coat. Um, it's disruptive markings, those white lines that you see. Um, kudus also have them um, and the purpose of them, I know I'm getting carried away now, but the purpose of them is both kudus and Inyala are browsers. So you find them in very dense vegetation and these disruptive markings actually breaks up the shape of the animal in amongst all the twigs and sticks um, and vegetation it makes it more difficult for predators to spot them. Um, but I just love the detail of the fur and the coat. What, looking back at this image, what I would have maybe changed now is only really the centers in focus. So we spoke about the elephant. So this was a photograph taken many years ago. Um, we spoke about the elephant and having a larger depth of field. You can see um, a lot of the image is, in, uh, is blurred except for the middle section. So going back a change I would make, remember we spoke about thinking of changes we would make for future opportunities, um, is in this case, I would have a higher aperture, a larger depth of field to have more in focus to showcase more detail. Another one. Um, so I find it very difficult. I don't know if any of you do, but I find it very difficult to photograph an animal when they're feeding. Um, to be completely open and honest with you, there, for me, it's, it's not attractive to take a photograph of an animal feeding. Um, it is a wild moment, especially to listen to the sounds and everything and to understand nature. Um, but for me, I always try and think of what else I can take 
um, from that sighting. So here you can see it's an image that I've actually, and it's still not quite perfect what I had in my mind. So I've had in my mind for many years, an image of a, a big male lion's claw on a, a buffalo or even a giraffe with all the nails out and pulling down. Just a close up tight shot of that. That's a shot that I've had in my mind for many years. I haven't got it yet. I've come, this is probably the closest I've come to it. But what happened here was there was a whole pride and they were feeding and they were fighting and they were moving. And it was very difficult to see or to get any kind of facial shots or um, even shooting wide. It was, the area was very dense. It was, it was, it was tricky to photograph. Um, it's, it's almost one of those moments where you take out your, your iPhone and you actually just video it for the sound. Um, but if you are there and you are wanting to take photographs, think outside the box. Don't focus necessarily always on where the action is happening. Look around you, assess the scene, check what is happening. And in this case, I noticed this paw and I was so hoping it's, it's actually, it was a, this is probably about a two year old line. Um, so I'm even very picky about the age, that doesn't matter. Um, anyways, moving on. I was so hoping that he would move his paw slightly further up to that darker area, it didn't happen. I am still very happy with this image. Um, because it's something different um, and because I managed to take something away. Like I said, I find it difficult to photograph animals feeding. So that is a time for me to look for different photographs. And that's what I share with guests on safari is, okay, guys, there is action. You've taken photographs or you've taken video of that, but have a look at this young male lion's paw. Look at it on, look at the claws out, zoom in, go tight, um, get a picture of the claws. It tells a completely different story. You don't have to, um, I mean, I'm perfectly happy to post this on social media because of the story that you can tell behind it in the caption, as opposed to the blood and gore and guts that, you know, it doesn't always go down well on, on social media. And, and like I said, I don't take photographs for social media. I take photographs for me, but there is many people out there that take it to get um, more likes, more followers and engagement and all of that kind of thing. So this is just looking and assessing the scene. This is my favorite photograph of all time. And the reason why I say that is because it's a photograph ever since I can, ever since I started guiding, it's a photograph that I wanted. Um, and this is a photograph that, that anyone can take. Uh, it's not an easy photograph to take, but it is possible. Um, there's a few different variables that you've got to take in mind. So, you know, um, this is obviously taken at night, it's backlit, um, sorry, that really captures, thank you Kayla, I appreciate the kind words. Um, so a photograph from the other side where the spotlight was coming from also shows off the male line beautifully, but you don't get the mist coming out the mouth. Um, so, you know, we sat there, this was in June of 2017 in the Saab Sands. Um, we sat there, it was a cold evening, everybody had jackets on, um, and we found this guy, the other vehicle, there was two vehicles, two of, um, two of us, and they hadn't, they hadn't come into the sighting yet, so we had the spotlight from our side and we were taking photographs of him, um, and he called a few times and roared, um, and we took a few photographs of him with the light on him, um, and then I had an idea because it's very difficult from your side shining the light to see that that steam coming out. Um, but then when the other guys pulled in, they obviously wanted to take photographs um, and capture his maid and his, the, you know, the intensity of the intensity of his face while he's calling. Um, so I said, we'll turn off our light. Um, and I said to everybody, guys, get ready. If he roars again, we might get steam coming out the mouth, which is going to be highlighted by the other spotlight. And even though we've got amazing images of the light on his face, we are gonna have something truly spectacular if he roars and we get the mist coming out of his mouth. And it must have been about 10 minutes later, he started. And as he started getting into that full on roar, this, this, this steam just poured out of his mouth. And it was just, it was a glorious moment. And, um, it was a very satisfying moment because um, firstly, my guest trusted me 
um, in terms of the spotlight, I could have shone the spotlight from this side as well when he when he called so that we could get more of the same photographs. Um, but it was just such a satisfying feeling because my guests trusted me in getting something different. So they took away multiple different images from the same sighting. Talking about leopards in a tree, there's a very different picture of a leopard in a tree. So yes, there's nothing wrong with taking a picture on and including the face or doing a tight shot of a leopard's face up in a tree. But if you wanna get creative, if you want to better your photography, push the boundaries, push yourself. Like I said, photography these days allows us the ability to delete images that we don't like. But like I said, understand why you're deleting that image. If you're playing around and you miss, and it happens to me all the time, you're playing around and you think, oh, that's, that's something different. That may be something a little bit more artistic or, um, you know, I can put this in black and white and it's gonna pop this and it's gonna do that. And, um, and then I, I, get, I get home and I download images and I try it and it doesn't quite work. I try and understand why it didn't work. Um, so that in future times, potentially I get a similar opportunity um, and I can then nail the shot. So this is also more almost high key. Um, the reason why I did this was um, firstly, I mentioned uh, okay, I've got hundreds of photos of leopards in this tree and that's not me bragging at all. I mean, I will take pictures of leopards in trees all day long. It's my favorite animal. Um, but what stuck out to me in this moment was this, this leopard was sitting in its tree and its paws and its tails were all dangling. And I thought it's a perfect op opportunity to take the focus away from the face, away from what everybody always generally wants to have in the photograph and to actually photograph something unique and something different. Um, so composition is completely different. It's not necessarily everyone's cup of tea, uh, but for me, something different, something unique of a leopard in a tree. And something else I can add to my portfolio of leopards. Light, using light. Um, so everybody, uh, it used to drive me crazy because every, every photographer that you drive who's been a photographer for many years always says, the light behind you, the light behind you. Let's get golden light on our subjects. Golden light on our subjects. We need the light. We need the light. Look at this image. Look at the mood created in this image. Look at where the light's coming from. This was taken at Clo Dam in Medique during the, the drier months. Elephants, it's, it's, Medique is a phenomenal game reserve. I was there about a week ago um, and absolutely loved it. Um, and this dam is one of the main features in the winter months. So um, anywhere from June, July, August, even now when I was there, I was there end of October, we hadn't got the first rains yet. So it was still super dry. Um, just the only difference is being the summer months, the window of opportunity with golden light um, is a lot shorter than what it is in winter. In winter, it's obviously a lot softer light. This image was taken in softer. So um, these shots are possible up until I would say October in Medique. Um, but it just creates this mood. You can see all the dust. You can, you can see the shadows. Um, you, the dead tree even adds to it. Um, the sun is there. So just in terms of a mood shot and setting a scene, um, you know, this is an iconic, it's not necessarily a different shot. Um, I mean, I think every wild eye guide that's gone to Medique has got the shot and, as well as guests. Um, but it's not necessarily a different shot, but it's an iconic shot for, um, for where, where I was. Another one, leopard in a thicket. Doesn't mean that there's no photograph. Look at the coat. Look at the detail. Shoot at a lower aperture. Here, here's where it changes to what I said earlier. Shoot at a lower aperture. Pick up the detail of the fur. Blur out the branches in the foreground. Coats. Look at the different patterns. Obviously shot with a, a greater depth of field so you can see the texture and the detail on the giraffe's body. Um, and it's, it's something different. It's not a tall giraffe just standing there. And it's another animal that's very difficult 
to photograph when it is very close to you and next to the vehicle. You can get great shots of its head, um, but what, what else can you do? You've always got to think of, and like I said, it's a fine balance between always taking photographs and enjoying the bush and enjoying the moment. You've got to find the balance between the two. So it's not necessarily that you've always got to be taking a photograph, but if you do, if your camera's next to you and you've got a giraffe standing next to you and you notice, wow, look at that texture. Look at the different patterns. Look at the, the shaded areas. This would also work very well as a black and white, by the way, because of the contrast. Um, pick up your camera, take a shot. It's worth taking a shot. This one, it's a bit of a mind boggling one. All I've done here, um, cheetah walking um, past some water, it's reflection, it's actually switched around. Um, I've done that afterwards intentionally. Um, it almost, it's, the, the, the water was so clear, the cheetah that is at the top is almost as sharp as the cheetah that's at the bottom, which is the real cheetah, if that makes sense. I feel like I said cheetah quite a lot there, um, but if that makes sense. So it's just, it's just thinking in a different way. And even the other way around with the reflection, it's still a very nice photograph, but how can I make it different? So this was a trip that Johan and I hosted together and I switched mine around and Johan kept his the same. So Johan's got the one exact same photo, but my bottom is his top and his top is my bottom, if that makes sense. Um, so we've got the same image and they've got a very different feel to them just because of the way that we um, not have edited them, but the way that we have switched them around. Angles, talk about zebras, uh, black and white animals, something different. Close up, look at the eyelashes. Um, here, I wanted to, I didn't want the whole animal in focus. I just wanted part of the animal in focus. Um, so I focused on the eye, I wanted the eyelashes, and I wanted to blur into the zebra's coat. Another one, close up, we spoke about it. Eyes, okay, it's different. We, we spoke about the giraffe's coat, the, the texture on the side. Um, when an elephant's standing right next to you, what, what do you do? You take pictures of its coat, you bring out that detail. Um, you look at its eye, can you see its eye? Is there any color coming out in its eye? What is the light doing? Here, I love this image because of the dappled light that you get on the elephant. And I love the detail that you get in the forehead. And it all tells a story of, you know, what this animal's been through in its life. The eye, the eye, the lights picked up the, the color in the eye. So the eye really pops out. Whereas sometimes with elephants, it's difficult because of their long eyelashes and because of the different angles that you sit at, you can't necessarily get a photograph of the eye. Something different, textures, elephants standing right next to you. What do you do if you want to photograph? There's two different textures here. So also, once again, shooting F14, getting as much in focus as possible. You've got the ear, the veins, you've got that texture, but then you've also got the wrinkles of the skin. That's also texture. It's all texture shots. It's something different. Um, it's, once again, thinking outside the box. Then we move on to panning and radial blur. This is a kind of photography that isn't for everybody. Um, it is quite a difficult thing to do, but if you do get it right, it um, can be very, very impressive. I'm going to show you some images. And basically what you do here is there's two ways of doing it. The easiest way to do it is to be on AV or A, um, depending if you're Nikon or Canon. Um, so that's aperture priority mode. Bring down your ISO to 100, 200 push up your aperture value to F22, and you will see looking through your viewfinder that your shutter speed is gonna slow down dramatically. So in order for panning and radial blur, well, not radial blur, but panning, in order for it to work, you need your subject to be moving. Um, so what it is, is there's a lot of different variables that will either work or not work in your favor here, is how fast is the animal moving? How big is the animal? Um, how fast does my shutter speed need to be or how slow does my shutter speed need to be to be able to still pick, pick out detail of my subject. Also, your subject's got to be running parallel with you. So the technique behind this, and it is a fun thing to play around with, especially when you've got, in a sighting, you've got great images, play around with herds of animals that are moving around. You think of going to the Maasai Mara and the Great Migration and the hundreds and thousands of wildebeest that you see, how many wide 
angle shots can you take of wildebeest feeding in the field? How many of those shots do you need? Try something different. Try getting them when they move. You know, when a, when a wildebeest moves, they move like sheep. It's not to say that take anything away from a wildebeest, but they do. It's sheep movement. So one starts running, they all start running. And it is a great way to practice this technique of panning. And what you would do is you would take a number of photographs starting at a 45 degree angle to your right or left, depending on which side the animal is coming from. And you will take a number of photographs continuously panning, moving with the same speed or as, as close to the same speed as the animal is possible. And you will shoot from 45 degrees to your right or your left to 45 degrees to the other side. You will find that the first few images are complete write-offs, but those images where that animal is parallel with you are gonna be the images that you're looking for. So it is not out of, if you take 10 images, if you only have one that looks like this picture on the screen, you have nailed it, you have one. Those other nine images do not matter. Um, you can delete those. Okay, so here's just a few to showcase it. So it's all about shutter speed. And the reason behind panning photography is to show off movement in animals. It's to add a different dimension into photography, to, to not just take a still picture and have it as a still picture, but to take a still picture and portray movement. Um, that is what panning does. Here's another one, wild dog on the move. And when you're panning properly and you're getting, it takes a lot of practice and it is, it can be frustrating, but it can also be very fun. Um, and it's playing around. Like I said, some people don't like it. Some people do. I enjoy it just because it is really fun to play around with these different techniques. And you never know exactly what you're going to come up with. But if you do get it right, what you find is you actually almost get parts of your animal in focus as it's moving. And behind it, um, you are blurring the background. But because you're moving at the same speed of the animal and because you have that motion and the slow shutter speed, you are blurring the background and you get these beautiful streaks through your image, which adds a lot to your image. Radial blur. How do we do it? Okay, so similar, pretty much exactly the same settings as you would use for um, panning is what you'll do for radial blur. And what you'll do, um, you cannot do it with a fixed lens, but you will, with a zoom lens, I take 100 to 400, for example, I will zoom in to and focus on the zebra's face. And then I will hold the shutter down, click, 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 and I'll zoom out in a steady motion. And by doing that, you start to get this effect where you can channel into a specific area. Okay, it's a very, yes, it's a very unnatural photograph. Um, but it doesn't necessarily show off movement, but you can channel one's eye into a specific area of a photograph. So immediately thinking of radial blur, that line photograph that I showed you earlier on at eye level where it's looking at you, imagine doing radial blur on that for something different now. If I got a similar opportunity, imagine you focused in, you zoomed in 100 to 400, you at 400 on that line's eye, slow shutter speed and you zoom out slowly taking multiple images imagine the image that you're going to have if you can create something like this that channels to that male's that male lion's eye it'll be absolutely beautiful drawing inspiration sorry i have gone on quite long and waffled on quite a bit Drawing inspiration. So I hope that all of you have taken something away from what I've spoken about today. And I hope that you get time to get in, uh, into the field soon and to practice new techniques and to push yourself. Drawing inspiration. I mentioned that because the reason behind it is I, I want you to go out there and I want you to follow different photographers. Don't necessarily just follow wildlife photographers. Follow different photographers. and it's not that you're going to copy their image, but it's going to give you an idea of exactly like what I've done now. I've gone through a bunch of images and I've explained them to you um, and my thinking process behind them. Um, so draw inspiration from other people that you follow, whether it be on Instagram, on Facebook, wherever it is. Look at those images. If you're scrolling through Instagram and an image makes you stop, stop and think to yourself, why did I stop on this image? What attracted me to it? What stood out? 
is it a different photograph? Is it something that's, that, that's unique that you haven't seen before? Or is it the colors or is it the, the composition? Is it the angle that the photographer got? Just start to process that in your mind. And I promise you, if you do what I've discussed with you tonight here, if you practice that and you look out for specific moments and you look around and you're not focused on one specific shot, your photography is going to grow dramatically. And it's not to say that any of you are taking bad photographs. Like I said, our styles are constantly developing and constantly growing. And that's what I want to share with you. And that's what I want you to take away from this today is don't settle for what your style is now. And it's not to say that your style is bad now. Don't settle, push yourself, stay stimulated and continue to grow as a photographer. So I thank you all for your time. Um, I hope that you found this um, helpful. I really do. Um, and yeah, think about it. If you have questions, get in touch with me. I'm more than happy to help you out. Um, I'm more than happy to do a FaceTime session or whatever and discuss photography with you. I'm always available. Let me know. Um, but for now, I'm going to say thank you. Um, I really, really hope that you enjoyed it. I enjoyed my evening with all of you, um, but I am going to say cheers and head off. Enjoy the rest of your day or night, wherever you may be. Thank you very much.